Staycation, short story by Michael Bota from the collection True Short Stories. Staycation, day one. We have this routine, me and my man, well, he's more of a boy than a man. Sam takes the car in the morning and drops JP at daycare. We have one car between us. I haven't driven it in forever. Then he jumps on the motorway. He hoons over to work. They usually stick him on demolition somewhere out south. Sammy only gets told by 0800 Labour where he's working at 6.15 every morning. The phone call is what gets him out of bed because Sammy, Sammy stays up so late gaming that he's always tired. Well, there are a couple of extra steps. He tries to bang me after I'm already asleep and I kick him out of bed. Then he gets in a half, plays games all night. He gets the call and hauls his jacket and boots on in the dark, thudding his 110 kilo tower of muscle and blubber across the floorboards. Then he does a lap of the house, kissing JP's cheek and the baby's cheek. And then he kisses my cheek. The kids never wake up, but I do. I can't sleep when we owe money. And we always owe money. I wake and I have 10 minutes to smoke on the patio in my nightshirt and knickers before Bubs wakes up. I think about our vacation to Timaru that's coming up. Yeah, it's not the fanciest place, but all my rallies are down there. Comfortable, chubby white people, the shape of dog roll who have these lifelong jobs that give them money to spend on shit that doesn't even need money spent on it. For example, stuff that doesn't even need replacing like new kitchens, new lounge suites. Every June when I take us down to Timaru, I tell everyone it's to let the kids see snow, but it's not that. To be honest, I take us to Timaru so I can get free stuff. Into my suitcase, my relatives will sneak books, silverware, posters, vouchers, perfume, pantyhose, bras, essential oils, you name it. They buy new stuff that they don't need. They give away stuff that they don't have to give away. I have to pay an excess baggage fee at the airport, but I get like a thousand bucks of stuff and my flight's only 250 I wish I could stay in their comfortable, large Timaru homes. It's not as if Auckland notices us gone. You lose your place in the rat race up here and the gap seals up straight away. So anyway, Sammy, he drives all morning and all evening to get his 16 bucks an hour. JP goes to his creepy free daycare at Church Unlimited. All the driving, all the churchy shit, it sucks ass. But without it, we wouldn't eat. Me? I stay home and look after bubs. Occasionally on dull day, if there's gas in the car, I can go to Kmart after the kids are asleep and I can slowly cruise the aisles, stroking the shelves, dreaming. Samsy always leaves me 10 bucks on the bank card. Says I can buy whatever I want. What I buy is applesauce baby food with the cash so I can distract bubs while I enjoy a simple, sweet cigarette. So we have our routine. Life is going alright until Sammy comes home early and announces after dinner that he's going to take the train for a while. I drill him with my eyes till I've got to the core of the lie and the truth spurts out. He's taken the train because the dumbass shithead has lost his driver license and he's lost the car. It's been impounded for 28 days. Pink stickered because Sam did a shit job on the brakes trying to save money. Now the road is way too worn down to drive it till they get replaced. I begin by throwing the remote control at his face. His big fat hand darts out and catches it. I grab one of his graphic novels off the kitchen table and rip that up instead. It doesn't cost as much to replace as the remote. He watches as I detach vintage Captain America's head from his body and dump the paper guts on the floor. After I've machine gunned him with swear words and had an angry smoke, Sam offers me a sesh. I roll my eyes and accept one, wiping the mouthpiece of the pipe extra hard to let him know his saliva is not going to be touching mine for a while. Here's what went down, Sam explains. He got pulled over on the motorway and instantly disqualified from driving on account of his demerit points, which he's been racking up for a while. Not that he even told me. He won't be able to drive for six months unless a lawyer gets the court to give him an exemption. A lawyer costs 500 bucks minimum. He was late for work because he stayed up late gaming, plus he got hooked on infomercials. The one about the lady who gets your drive license back from court, the spray and walk away one, the one for Singnet, that stupid irritating internet service provider run by Warren Singh, who we went to school with, who became a big shot in software, rubbing his success in our faces through the TV. Ugh. After the infomercial, 
Sam found it even harder than before to sleep. He couldn't stop scrolling Warren Singh's timeline on Facebook. He was Warren at the Grand Prix in Dubai, Warren mountain biking down Mauna Loa in Hawaii, jet skiing in Monaco. And Sammy, stoned, jealous, depressed, finally got to sleep at 3.30 a.m. The way his hands and lips hover, I can tell that Sammy's about to add that he had to go to the couch because I wouldn't put out. But he sees my face and he doesn't go there. He stops. I cry so hard, the lounge goes all blurry. Then I lock myself in the bedroom for the night. He shakes me awake sometime later in some deep spot in our blackness. The bed creaks as he sits. He's lighting himself with his cell phone. A streak of white grin splits his face. His pink eyes are shining with excitement. Staycation, yeah, that's the answer. Sammy goes, shaking my shoulder. Hey babe, screw to Maru. A holiday in our heads. I'm honestly saving us a ton of money. <sighs> Till you get work closer to home. Work I don't need to drive for, he responds. Correct. I roll over and squeeze the pillow around my head. Sammy plants his bum on the bed. I can tell he's waiting for sex. He thinks he deserves a reward for his genius idea. Next day I wake a whole hour later than usual. Sammy is jiggling bubs on his shoulder. JP is playing Minecraft on the Xbox 360. Sammy is proud of himself. Baby in one hand, coffee in the other. A coffee he has apparently been waiting to deliver to me all morning. I haul myself up, back against the wall. I take it you're not bussing to work today. Let the staycation begin, he says, and he winks, then returns to the lounge where I can hear the couch cushions being pulled out and woomphing on the floor. He's building a fort. Day two. I'm sitting on the deck swirling my toes in buckets of warm water trying to enjoy my budget spa. I'm in the shadow of the towering pylon in our yard. Sparrows play on the power lines. I can't stop thinking how urgent it is to call Timaru and tell them we're not coming. <sighs> we're taking a holiday in our heads, I explain to my auntie Faye when I get on the phone. It's like you stay home and you do some meditating, you think hard about all the good salads you've had in the past, the Mai Tais, I don't know, you just meditate. You appreciate the sparrows in the trees, I suppose. Going for walks to the river and that. Okay, babe, she tells me. I can hear coins rattling behind her. Auntie Faye's at the Christchurch Casino, of course. She has so much money, she gets to risk it. Me and Sammy, we can barely risk it in instant Kiwi. You know they have rivers in Tahiti, right, Nessie? Timaru, I correct her. Tahiti will never happen. You should have married that little tryhard you went to school with. You'd be living the high life on the Gold Coast by now. What was his name, the computer nerd? Wally? Warren. Warren Singh. I light a smoke and swirl my toes. I've got to go anyway, Auntie Faye. I hear people whooping around her like money doesn't matter. Sam comes onto the deck with a vodka and water. Vodka's the cheapest stuff in the universe. It makes me forget about saving my bacon home direct barter card. Mr. Della Cruz, the landlord. It's 10.30 in the morning. If we're pretending to be on holiday, we might as well get loaded. We could pretend we're in Goa, he suggests. Everyone around here speaks Malay lamb anyway. <laughs> I snorted his dumb joke. Get up and go inside and catch up with bubs. Bubs have been gnawing on a rubber teething ring that my rallies gave me. Ring I had to clean with disinfectant because one of my baby cousins had half used it already. JP's scribbling in a colouring book with some other kid's name in it. He'll colour, he'll play blocks, he'll do a little Nintendo, a little Xbox. I can breathe a little. Actually, I can breathe a lot because I don't have to wear my bra that's too tight. Going braless is okay, so long as I don't have to go outside. I make a point of not checking the mail for catalogues. This staycation thing, it has its pluses. I crawl into the blanket fort that the boys have made under the table. Sam's inside the blanket fort, resting his back against the wall, eyes sealed, lips twitching with contentment. Sam will be thinking back to that time that he worked two jobs to afford a one-way ticket to Comic-Con where he got to shake Harrison Ford's hand. He'll be remembering himself at 15,000 feet over the Pacific, tilting his champagne flute towards a pretty air hostess smiling down on him, her face bathed in sunlight. I doubt a grumpy wife and whining baby are part of his bliss dream. Cozy in the dark cave, I close my eyes. I can feel my dressing gown falling open, my nips and belly button showing. Where should I go to find happiness? My last birthday when the highlight was three breakfast roses which pricked my thumbs because Sammy had stolen them from the RSA and sprinted away and hadn't remembered to take the thorns off. Was I happy the last time I woke up with no bills or worries or pressure or 
wishing I was someone else. God. Yesterday I had 10 notifications on Facebook. I was a minor celeb. I linger on that sensation for a moment. Cheesecake. Yeah. I linger on cheesecake. Because it was two days ago, Sam brought home the slice of Black Forest cheesecake. Somebody had been leaving work. And Sammy resisted eating his slice. He drove it 55 minutes through rush hour traffic, carefully stored in a Chinese takeaway tray, so he could present the 20th of a cake to me. I munched my $3.80 worth of cake. Sam watched like a dog. A crumb of white chocolate fell on the carpet, and he asked permission to eat it. I furrowed my eyelids. I squint, I mash my face, I block out the reality of South Auckland till the trance takes me. I am unpackaging the certificate for my diploma in aromatherapy that's arrived in the mail. It is 2011 and I'm going to set up a home office with a special reclining seat for clients. I just need to complete a business course. My tummy is tight, my boobs are pointy, the skin on my face is as firm and moist as clay. It's, it's 2010. I'm, I'm up north. There are palm trees up here. I pull over at a bay to wee and there are dolphins out in the water, six little fins, streaks of grey. I don't have any money, just enough for a tank of petrol to get back. I'm two hours past the Bay of Islands. I'm going to work half the year here. I'm interviewing for a job at the Carrington Estate Golf Course overlooking Cloudy Bay's warm waves. All money and cocktails and bow ties. Everyone is from Shanghai, Macau or Singapore. Maybe I'll learn a new language. I'm on the road by myself in the car. Sammy... Sammy's over the horizon. The interview is exciting enough, except it's a zero-hour contract. There will be long stretches without pay. The guy at Carrington keeps licking his lips, staring at my tits. I don't kid myself, I'm some beauty. I just have on my slutty, sparkly clubbing top and eyeshadow. It's me who says, well, thanks for today's opportunity. I'm the first to stand up and stick my hand out. The car thunks and groans as I'm leaving the resort. There are two miles of private palms and fountains before I'm back on the highway. There's a pub in this little tin shuttered town called Moitawa that hasn't had a do-up since the 80s. I'm speeding and laughing and crying and hoping I crash so being broke doesn't last any longer. It is impossible to get a job. It is impossible to study. It is impossible to be careless. Fuck everything. I park in a pothole. I walk through a puddle into the grotty Moirewa pub place. I'm the only white girl there. These two Maori guys with long black hair and bad skin put their arms around me, usher me to their corner. There are some old Maori ladies and they tut and shake their heads. The Maori guys buy me jug after jug of beer. Suddenly karaoke is erupting and my mouth is excited. I'm amazing at reggae after a couple of chugs. I belt out red, red wine, buffalo, soja, and some duet where one of the Maori guys does the shaggy words and I play the girl. It's midnight now. There's no way I can drive back to Auckland this pissed. People are coupling together. They're trudging across the gravel to finish the night. Some of them are tilting back the passenger seats of their cars and shagging. Mummy! I tell the gross, gross old men I have to get something from my car. Sammy's car, actually. God, I miss him. <laughs> miss his big fat throat. His man boobs, his belly, the pit he makes in the bed. I'm desperate to wee, but I start the engine instead and drive and drive and wait to find the headlights of a truck stabbing my eyes and I veer off the road and branches scratch the windscreen. I wake with the birds, reverse, spattering mud, drive all the way home over the bridge, charging into Auckland till I see headscarves, billboards, overpasses, Dom Road, safe from danger. I leave the car in the driveway. I rush inside. I kiss my babies and tug Sammy towards a... <coughs> Bedroom. Fuck! I attempt to stand. Donk. The underside of the table wallops my skull. The fort is collapsed and cut open with light. I stagger to the baby's bedroom. Sam has reached it just before me and he's jiggling bubs. He hands her to me with shriveled up lips and he leaves. I shush my little bubbly girl. I don't hear any noise from the other room except an occasional snort. Yeah, I know Sammy's crawled inside his mind. Because there's no screaming baby there. Day six. We wake at noon, we trudge to the table, crawl under, and holiday in our heads. Rain tickles the windows. Wind tries to find a hole to slide its fingers through. JP prods us occasionally, prying our eyelids open, but not too often. He mostly plays with a box of Duplo Sammy found on a treasure trash mission in Epsom. Or Sammy scribbles in his colouring book or plays his Nintendo. 
He's a good boy. If we really weren't Tahiti, he'd be doing the same shit anyway, I figure. Baby would still scream every hour. Me and Sammy still be three meals a day, ten trips to the toilet where the surfers or sanding him. This vacation thing, it's not bad. You know what, more importantly? It's affordable. We don't interrupt each other's memories to ask where we're each going. That is rude. That is invasive. It is like reading someone's journal. We only find out who's remembering what the next day when we fight. And every memory, (laughs) every memory means a fight. Sam revisits the stag party that him and his boys had two years ago. It was on Lake Topor and there was water skiing and a sand sculpture competition and flirting with German skanks. Inside his mind, Sam enjoys Brazilian barbecued kebabs, gateau, margaritas, car lure shots, a backpacker in a purple thong sitting on his lap, his friends clutching their guts with laughter. Sam is dancing, chanting, drinking, laughing, kissing the groom. He hikes up a mountain in the morning with his best buds. There is champagne, there is ice air at the top. A crowd of thousands watching the rugby. More tears and hugs. White water rafting. Sam shouting at his mates that he loves them. Crowd surfing. Chanting Chumbawamba. Wrestling on a riverbank. Shots of Jaeger and Sambuca. And finally Sam running out of a Cessna plane. Tumbling over a green earth. Just him and his mates. Sammy? I notice he's twisting the wedding ring on his chubby finger. Sammy! He opens his eyes and looks at me like he's never seen me before. Bubs is crying. It's my turn. Sam takes the kids onto the lawn to gather a sack of pine cones for the fire. I tell him to get the kids to take out the recycling and hang the laundry and do those dishes, please. Plus JP has got his immunisation jab at two. I get comfy. Back against the wall. I close my eyes. I think deep. My friend Ash... She wants to go to the Nines in Sydney. I don't follow league. It's apparently some kind of two-day thing where like 80,000 people pack a stadium and you get dressed up. Sounds wild. Sounds unpredictable. Yeah, bitch. Sydney, baby. We each spent an hour on the Kiwi Bank website till we got fresh credit cards approved. Then we ring each other up and scream some more. We are seriously doing this. It's about girl power. Me and Sam have only been together a couple of years. Marriage is bullshit. Sam doesn't own me. But Sydney though, fuck yeah! Bored in the stands at the league, me and Ash chat up this Arabian noble dude in a silver suit. Soon me and Ash are up in a corporate box. Guys are eating us with their eyes. This rich Egyptian guy, Hamid, he says he'll give us a ride in his convertible. This isn't part of the plan. This isn't a sad taxi to the airport to go back home to fucking New Zealand. So we zigzag through traffic, standing half out of the sunroof, holding onto our glasses, guzzling champagne from the bottle. Hamid's mansion is on the edge of a cliff. There is a spa pool embedded in the rocks. We kick our high heels into the foaming ocean. We pash, we giggle. I lie on top of his grand piano, crooning and laughing while Ash fingers the keys and Hamid smokes a cigar, leaning against the doorframe. Me and Ash crash out on a fluffy tiger skin rug, cuddling each other. At dawn, we leave all our stuff behind on Hamid's breakfast bar, escape to the beach, walk three miles around the rocks, emerge in some cafe with cut-up feet, no handbags, no passports, no cell phones, but wincing with excitement. We jump into a van load of hippies. Over two weeks, we drive to some festival called Dragon Dreaming and back. We drink kava. We wash amongst the lily pads in Lake George. We eat damper bread cooked between gum trees and some deep in some national park. I get a urinary tract infection. It's 200 k's before we find a gas station that sells cranberry juice. Ash gets crabs. She has to crush them with her fingernails. My cran juice reminds the driver that there's money picking berries down in the snowy mountains where the tourists are if we want it. We spend a day mucking out a barn, two days on the berries. Ash goes for a drive with some farmer boy for an hour and comes back with 300 bucks and bruises on her neck. It is terrifying. It is exhilarating. Me and Ash work in a cowboy bar for two weeks. Every night we ride the bucking bronco and sleep cuddling each other in some boy's bed. We have less money and more joy than ever. We shoplift from the store. We smuggle eyeliner between our butt cheeks, bottles of shampoo under our belts. Some nights we dance on the bar. I let men pash me, buy me drinks and chicken wings. It is three weeks before we pay off the advance wages we got. I wake up desperate one morning. I have 
almost forgotten my old life. Sam must be missing me. There is only one person I can think of who can help me get back home. Warren Singh arrives at the speed of light. He has one of the fastest cars in the state, he tells me as he picks me up from Threadbow and drives over the border in his Ferrari. He's come from Melbourne today, but he has a chalet around here somewhere, he explains, looking across at me. This man with his jolt hair and black leather seats and ridiculous gloves, this was the boy who took me to prom. Warren has a private jet parked outside Threadbow. We were in Melbourne an hour later up in his penthouse apartment 25 minutes after that. I try to talk to him like a normal friend. Try to tell him that in my real life I ended up with Samuel McDonald from school. Remember him, Warren? He was in your little dorky investors club where you all printed your own business cards. I tell Warren that I cater weddings for a job now. I don't tell him sometimes I make fake accounts to sell phantom playstations on Trade Me. Sam is finishing his master's in legal studies, I explained, plus he's got an LLB. Not that either, either of those gets you anywhere unless you know a practicing lawyer personally. He's a labourer, day to day, sure. But that doesn't define him. Sam could do a lot of amazing things in this world if he applied himself. Warren is nodding, but his eyes are on my lips, my hips. Warren parks in a black basement, three levels underground. We ride the elevator into a heaven of glass, 40 floors up. Warren invites me to watch while he opens his internet banking. I start to tell him he doesn't really have to give me money. I can get by okay, but my sentence is floppy and limp. The words dribble into my drink. He transfers 5,000 bucks into my bank account. Straight away my MasterCard, the save my bacon little loan that got me through Threadbow, all balanced. Warren leaves me with 1500 in my bank account. He even logs into the Air New Zealand website and buys me a ticket home. By now I am wet with gratitude. I keep clenching my thighs. Warren's hair gel and his foundation can't hide his pock marks and his dandruff. He's disgusting and spindly, but I owe him something. <laughs> Would have been trapped in Australia forever. Of course I have to let my body sleep with them. We already half did it on prom night anyway. I let Warren go down on me on the balcony overlooking the river. The glittering towers, the palm trees, the cafes, the millionaires. I buck my hips, I bite my finger. I try to enjoy it. Warren can't hold a rhythm. He rubs my clit clockwise and counterclockwise, messy as a kid finger painting. He keeps using cliches that sounds like he's copied from a porno movie. I try to pretend I haven't noticed the how to make her come instructions that he's printed and magneted to his fridge and forgot to take down. I pretend I'm not lost at 24 and a half, hoping I'm not pregnant from all the stuff that's happened since I got on a plane to go party with my best friend. Warren chews my pussy, but I'm dry and wriggly and my legs are starting to cramp. I nervously ask for a lift to the airport, and Warren says, that was the deal, as if he's just completed some business transaction. I limp into Auckland Airport, swooning with exhaustion. Sammy picks me up. The car smells safe. When we turn the lights out, Sammy rolls on top of me. He's gotten fatter while I've been away, like he's planned to weigh me down. I let him come in me with no condom. A month later, my tummy hurts and I'm too anxious to do the math in my head, so I have to write down my sex dates on the back of a bus timetable in the waiting room and the nurse slash counsellor says I'm having a baby, except, except I can't be tied down with a baby because I haven't had a chance to figure out what I'm doing with my life. I can't get pregnant now, especially not to Samuel McDonald, who got his name legally changed from Samuel to Samwell as a reference to some Lord of the Thrones geek shit that he's into. This can't be where my ride ends. God, give me more time. Day 10. I'm climbing through Coromandel's rainforest today on school camp. So I sellotape a sign to the outside of the blanket fort that says, Do not disturb. Rain rakes the windows. Sammy reminds me he's taken the kids to the library and the gardens and the playground and the mall, all free. And now it's his turn in the fort. It's freezing because we're trying to keep the power bill down and we're out of pine cones and his words come with a cloud of warm breath. I remind him to read the sign, do not disturb. JP touches the oven that admittedly I've left on for too long and he shrieks. 
I get Sammy to take care of calling JP's burn fingers. I feel bad that Sam keeps having to give Bubs her formula. I once went even my nipples brush my singlet. They're hard and crusty, but the thing is I can't waste time breastfeeding. I have to revisit good times before the memory swirls down the plug hole. I can be happy if I just concentrate and hide in my dark place. If I appreciate the opportunities I once had, go back in time and eat slower. Savour every smoke, every snort. My wrinkle-free skin, my taut throat, hair without a single silver strand, big gums, white teeth, bird legs, huge blue eyes, natural lashes, my cheekbones bursting. I was a size eight. God. It's prom night. The pinnacle of my life. I have chosen Warren Singh over Samuel McDonald because Sammy is about a five out of ten in terms of school reputation. Pretty much a nobody. But Warren is president of the Youth and Business Society, and he is a 6 out of 10 on account of all the awards he won in assembly. A 6 beats a 5. It's nothing personal. Sammy finds me on MySpace and sends me a message that simply says, I trust he'll treat you well without any explanation. Ugh. Come on, I've only ever exchanged like 10 words with Sam. It's cute enough, he's a little bit like a polar bear, but... Just he's too nice. Nice isn't an ambition. Nice isn't exciting. As for Warren, he's messaging me too. Sending me love poems from his fancy email address, warren at sing.com. I've never even seen a TV show about someone my age running a business, let alone come across it in real life. Nobody thinks it's cool to register his company when he turns 18, to buy bandwidth super cheap, to lowball the competitors, walking door to door with his lame little briefcase telling people SingNet could give them internet for half the price they're currently paying. By the time Warren takes what is now SingNet public at 21 and his stock becomes worth 1.3 mil, then we start to think that he is cool. Sam has been in the Young Investors Club with Warren. Warren holds on to some of Sam's magic cards. Sam holds on to $200 of Warren's shares. So long as Singnet keeps soaring, Sam's stock will triple in value, then go beyond. October the 1st, 2008, is prom night. It becomes obvious Warren has paid a shitload for ballroom dancing lessons, paid with dividends from the Young Investors Club, undoubtedly. He makes a big deal out of twirling me, catching my back, brushing his cheek against mine, going through some routine he's seen on a movie, pretty much. My friends, though, my friends are jealous as fuck. Warren rises to a 7 out of 10 that night in the limo on the way to the after party without asking. He puts his hand up my dress, slides a finger into me, then two. I slacken my tense muscles, I let him do his thing. I may as well collect a story for the girls. Sammy. Sammy shows up at the after party, surprisingly, wearing a Warcraft t-shirt with a corsage on it. He approaches me just once in the night, looking serious as if he has a death to announce. Is he respecting you? Sammy asks in a worried voice like I'm his child. Not did you score. Not did you get laid, girl. Not did he show you his credit card. Just is he respecting you? But that memory is not the most vacation-y. I delve further back. It's 2007. I sweep crumbs off a bakery floor and I take home free cinnamon rolls on Saturday afternoons. I spend all my babysitting money on petrol, filling a, fill up a boy's tank and he will drive all night and let you sit up front. Sundays I sleep. My chest is hard and jiggles just a little. My eyes go bright and wide. My hair reaches down to my bum. It's 2006 and I've saved up to buy my first phone. I keep the box in a drawer and even the little plastic bags and twisty ties and instruction booklet. I lie on my belly and on my bed. Every time my phone dings with a message, joyous little fish tumble in my tummy. It's 2000 something and we've got our mid-year exams back and that computer club cocksucker Warren Singh has made a website listing everyone's results because he hacked into the school server and everyone in the hallway knows I got 39% in English. It's 2014. 
And we could really use some fucking money right now. And I'm buffing pack and say buns at Sammy's head because I'm sick of living off bread. Because Sammy's just told me he sold his shares in Singnet to pay the debt on that case of Valerian oil and our kindergarten bill. And yes, Sammy says he acknowledges that the value of the stock was going up and up and up. And yes, he acknowledges he's a fucking idiot, but he says he couldn't stand the idea of profiting from somebody who doesn't respect me. Day 12. Sam quits using before me. Well, quits using staycation trips, that is. He asks why I was groaning the other day. Coming, he says. Can't find a better word. You were getting off on your trip. Not with me, I don't think. You don't have to answer that. It's not a question. I wasn't, I begin. And I give up immediately. You don't need to even tell me who it was. I don't care. I'm done, Sam's saying as I lift a flap of the yurt and peek out. We're off to the park, then I got a meeting with that lawyer chick from 0508 disqualified. Should be able to get a temporary license. Um, yeah, Sammy, if you pay her with 500, which we don't have. He holds the door open while JP steps into his gumboots. Have fun wherever you're going today. Fuck you. I'm going back where I was happy. That's where. It's 2004, and I'm in Disney World, Orlando, Florida, with Auntie Faye, and she gives me a hundred bucks at nine o'clock in the morning, and tells me to meet her in eight hours for dinner. I am completely free and rich and so happy I don't want the day to end. It is 2003, and I score my first goal, and the girls hoist me onto their sunny shoulders and thrust me up near God. It's 2002, and I'm having my first kiss, and my heart is a hot, exploding engine. Darren Samu's huge nose pokes my eye and I scream and clutch my eye socket. While I'm screaming and tossing, Darren connects with my surprised lips and I shut up. He rotates 90 degrees, kisses my mouth from the other side. My tongue emerges like an eel, hits the slippery flesh between his gums and tongue. His mouth is blue from the lolly he's been sucking on. We separate, surprised. I am flushed with happiness for a week. It's like a midwinter birthday, a personal Christmas. My mom asks me why I'm glowing. I am the queen of my group. It's 2018, and I'm surfacing. It's... God, it's gone dark. Where's Bubs? She's at Nana's, Sammy says. I emerge from the fort. He is sitting on the couch with his Nintendo Switch. He's in a t-shirt, even though it's... Muggy? Got the car back and my license while you were in La La Land. I, I must have slipped through. You went too far back, I reckon. Just my opinion, but if you want to find a place you had it sweet, look back two weeks ago. I got a Sahita too, by the way. So you're going back to work, Sammy, or... My lawyer, the one who got me my license back? I'm her assistant now. She likes my masters, says I can work from home, do daddy stuff with bub... Hell of, a, hell of a lot better money than 0800 labour. I sit on the floor. I hug my knees. Sammy throws the keys at me pretty hard. Look, the car's in the driveway. Take it, take it out. Do something YOLO. Start tomorrow. He looms over me, then bends down to where my starved, stinking body is crumpled on the floor. He almost kisses me, then pats my skull like I'm a silly, spoiled kid. Just be home for dinner.